This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Well, scientists at the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, released a report Thursday showing that July was Earth's hottest month on record. Nine of the ten hottest months since record-keeping began in 1880 have occurred since 2005. Climatologists also expect 2015 to be the hottest year on record. This news comes as scientists from Columbia University's Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory released a report which shows that global warming has worsened the California drought, now entering its fourth year. This new study is the first to estimate the extent to which rising temperatures are affecting the loss of moisture from plants and soil, and suggests that within a few decades, continually increasing temperatures and resulting moisture losses will push California into a permanent drought by 2060. Joining us now to discuss the report and the impact of the findings is the study's lead author, Park Williams. He's a bioclimatologist at Columbia University's Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory. Welcome to Democracy Now! It's great to have you with us. Thank you very much. So, lay out the main findings of your report. Sure. So, I think we all know that as you warm the air, then uh, the warmer air is able to more easily extract water from soils. We know this because a puddle on a sidewalk on a hot day uh, will evaporate more quickly than a puddle on a cold day. And so as we warm the atmosphere over, over a century, as we've done, that atmosphere is more able to pull water out of soils. And then when natural climate variability causes a drought, as is happening right now in California, the drought is probably going to be worse. But we've never actually put a number on that, how much worse or how much the, the, of the California drought or of any drought is due to global warming. And what my colleagues and I did is put the number on that for the first time. We finds that in the absence of global warming, the drought in California would have been somewhere between 8 and 27 percent less severe. And, but how were you able to reach that conclusion? Well, we uh, reached it using observed climate data. So we used monthly precipitation data, and then all of the uh, we used monthly data from all the variables that uh, go into calculating evaporation. So that's four variables, temperature, uh, humidity, wind speed, and solar radiation. And it turns out that in terms of the year-to-year -year variability and in terms of trends in evaporation, temperature is the most important of those four. And so we then use very standard soil moisture modeling uh, methods where we basically treat California as this large network of buckets. And we use the climate data to, with precipitation, fill up the buckets, kind of like uh, income fills up a bank account. And then we use the evaporation data to extract water from the bucket, like withdrawals from a bank account. And over time, we we're able to track how much water is in the buckets, and the changes represent changes in drought severity in California. NOAA sponsored a study last year that blamed the rain deficit on what's basically a weather-related phenomenon, what a high-pressure ridge over the Northeast Pacific that probably had nothing to do with global warming. Does your report contradict this? No, it doesn't. I'm really glad that you're giving me an opportunity to talk about this. One of the, uh, the actually the lead author of the NOAA study that you just talked about is the second author of this study that I've published, and uh, they're very, two very different studies. And so I was just talking about inputs into the water balance and withdrawals from the water balance. That, that study by NOAA was all about the inputs. That, that study found that the drought is ultimately caused by a lack of precipitation, and that lack of precipitation is ultimately caused by this really persistent high-pressure ridge of the atmosphere that has been sitting over the uh, Northeast Pacific Ocean and blocking storms from hitting California now for four years in a row. It's a really abnormal event, and they find no connection with the global warming process and that ridge or that high-pressure region. We look at the other side of the water balance equation, the withdrawal side, and evaporation has been increasing because of uh, warming, and so even though climate change has not affected the precipitation, precipitation is just wildly variable in California from year to year, and so is evaporation, but underlying both of those variable things that occur naturally is this elephant in the room that's continued to grow larger every year, and it is now, when it gets dry naturally, it is now more dry because of climate change. And the economic impact on California, we're seeing all these reports uh, of the battles over water, obviously uh, exacerbated by the, depending on income levels of the, the, the people experiencing it, uh, and uh, land sinking, and uh, because of the water being drawn out from uh, underground wells or aquifers. 
Well, yeah, California is seeing a lot of consequences of this drought, and all droughts have consequences. And the uh, presumably, it's the it's the kind of weakest links in the network that start showing signs of vulnerability first. And so, we have uh, we have uh, poor communities that are suffering. It's, uh, in some of these communities, water is no longer accessible. They relied on well water, but now the water table is too low to accept, to access water, and so water has to be shipped in some places. Uh, land is sinking in the southern Central Valley, and the reason is because water has been extracted from the ground at an unsustainable pace. Sinking two inches every month now in San Joaquin Valley. It's it's really remarkable. These, these are uh, this is a, uh, from my understanding, this is part of an aquifer that that uh, was established. Uh, following the last glacial period. And while it is possible to put new water into some places underground, it is no longer possible in these places where the, where the ground has compacted uh, because we've extracted the water too quickly. You also are a specialist on how climate change affects uh, forests worldwide. Rolling Stone wrote about you in a piece. Yes, I, uh, I am one of many who study that topic, and uh, most of my work so far has been focused on the southwest United States, which is still really relevant to California. Uh, what we've found in, in, uh, in that work is that wildfire is a, direct, is a direct link to the climate system. I believe it's part of the climate system. When you have drought, then as long as there's fuels to burn, fuels being forests, then they will burn. And we're seeing that in California now. We're seeing it in Oregon and Washington as well because of intense drought. Now, again, this drought is caused by natural climate variability, and we'd be seeing a big fire year no matter what. But with this added impact of warming, the, wild, the wildfire season is, is more active. And there's a secondary effect that we have too many trees uh, on the landscape right now. We've been fighting fires for a century, and that means some places haven't had fire in a century. And there's a lot of fuel now ready so that when a spark goes on the wrong day, we have wildfires that are far more energetic than they would be otherwise. I wanted to ask you about the increasing involvement of faith leaders in the issue of uh, climate change. Uh, earlier this week, a group of Islamic scholars issued a, a call for a rapid end of the use of fossil fuels. And uh, a couple of months ago, the Pope released his groundbreaking encyclical uh, on the environment. Uh, as a scientist, what's your reaction to seeing now this uh, increasing involvement of faith leaders uh, as, a, as a moral and, uh, and religious issue that uh, the world coming to grips with climate change? Well, I think it's encouraging. I think that uh, the science of global warming is based purely in physics, not in, not in faith and not in politics. And the science of how warming affects drought is also based purely in physics. And uh, so, so I'm really happy to see that, that uh, uh, leaders of any kind are, uh, are letting people know, hey, this, this makes sense and we should really be taking care of our planet. Uh, physics tells us that we haven't been. How do we take care of the planet? How do we reverse climate change? Well, uh, so so this most recent work is on California, and I think California actually has a uh, a unique role in the world uh, when they when they change policy to become more efficient with their carbon use by using less gasoline, for example. Then the rest of the United States is soon to follow, and when the United States makes a change, then the rest of the world is soon to follow. And so California really has a surprisingly large ripple effect, I believe. And so one thing we need to do globally, of course, is, is uh, use uh, fossil fuels in a sustainable way. I don't think that that uh, should go against anybody's political beliefs. Just sustainable living makes sense, and digging up a non-renewable resource and continuing to burn it until it's gone doesn't. Um, from the drought perspective, California can do a lot more locally. Uh, by using water sustainably. And there's been a lot of, as we said, unsustainable groundwater use in California. And currently, uh, actions are being taken to try and start regulations for groundwater extraction in California. What California tends to do, though, is once it gets wet again, because of natural climate variability, they tend to forget that they just had a really catastrophic drought that reminded how, them how vulnerable they are. When it gets wet in another year or two, it's important that California does not drop these measures that it's beginning to make towards groundwater regulation. And what are some of the other uh, uh, sustainable measures they could take? I mean, I'm always astounded when I, uh, I learned a few years ago that the average golf course uh, requires in, this, in, in during the, the hottest parts of the year uh, as much as 300, 400,000 gallons of water a day. <laughs> it, it, 
The numbers are astounding that uh, golf courses and lawns use. Um, although I, I would argue that they, in terms of sustainability for ground, or I'm sorry, for water use in California or for anywhere, you really need to, the goal I think should be to create systems that are resilient to the worst droughts. And California, that's very difficult to find to that point because California's precipitation, that's rainfall and snow, varies so wildly from year to year. It's tough to remember exactly where the worst exists. But things like lawns and golf courses are actually pretty easy to, you just cut the cut the uh, the pipe for the lawn and golf course, let it go dry, and nobody really cares. The things that are really tough, or the things that make drought effects really tough in California are things that are difficult to cut the line to. So uh, people in, in the agricultural communities, people's livelihoods rely on agriculture, but some of our agricultural practices probably aren't sustainable. And the, the fix is much more difficult. Well, Park Williams, want to thank you very much for being with us, bioclimatologist at Columbia University's Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory, lead author on a new report showing global warming has worsened the California drought by up to 27 percent. We'll link to that report at democracynow.org. This is Democracy Now! We'll be back in a minute.